Welcome. You're at the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching. And today it is particularly exciting for me because our presenters are three graduate students who show above average initiative, intellectual curiosity, and commitment to what happens in the classroom. Um, they took a sort of risk last summer with, um, I hope, the support of CSET. I hope it felt like support. And in addition, they're willing to share their experience with you. And so this willingness to take intellectual risks continues. And it's part of what CSET tries to foster, not just with our graduate students, but with anyone we work with, in that search for excellence and how to support it. So I am really excited to introduce Emma Ray, Catherine Ray, and Sarah Dozier. And I will turn it over to you because I know what excellent teachers you are, and the last thing we need is me talking about. So, well, there we go. That was great. They tasked me to give a little introduction to, to our team. I wasn't quite sure how I got assigned with that, but <laughs> Janet actually took the words that we prepared rather out of our mouth. We wanted to say that we really want to thank the center, particularly Janet and Tammy, for it. And there was this exact parallel, parallel to what you said to what I had planned to say, which was for giving us intellectual space to go ahead and take a risk and try something that we were really passionate about and that we didn't really know what it would look like and it was it unfolded as we went along. Uh, and then a lot of structural support from the center as well, building from the best practices that they're working to make clear about professional development. So we have found it a really incredible opportunity to, to work here and it's been a really, really great home. Um, Unprepared that our remarks matched each other. <laughs> <laughs> Unprepared. Janet's very busy. We have to touch base on the final. Triangulating on the truth. <laughs> so um, what we're planning to do today is talk about this professional development program that we put on called Chemistry for Social Justice. We're going to talk a little bit about our theoretical framing, the workshop we gave. We were very excited that a teacher went out in the real world and implemented some of the materials we had developed, so we're going to share a little bit about that with you, and then um, give some reflections and tell you what we're thinking about next, and hopefully that, that's uh, a conversation for, for all of us. So we um, encourage you to go ahead and, and chime in with ideas as we go. You're welcome to, to ask questions as we move along. Um, we'll introduce ourselves really quickly and then just ask everyone in the room to give a quick introduction since this is a... We have people coming in from all over, which is which is so exciting. Uh, okay, so I'm in the middle there, Emily Ray. I'm a third-year PhD, PhD student in science education. Um, <clears throat> my background is as a chemistry teacher, although my current research interests are more in discourse and argumentation in the classroom. Okay. I'm Catherine Rebuy. I'm a second-year PhD student here. I was a high school chemistry teacher for about 10 years before coming back to school. Um, and this area of Equity and social justice is where my research interests lie. I'm Sarah Dozier. I too was a high school chemistry teacher as well as biology and other duties as assigned. And um, I am happy to say that I'm a second year PhD student here. <laughs> and my research interests are really around performance assessment, but I've also done a lot of professional development in my past life. So it was really fun to bring all of that stuff together into this workshop and work with amazing colleagues. So if we could just run around, maybe if you can give your name and affiliation. Physicist by training, science educator by retirement avocation. <laughs> 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 and uh, I come to be educated. I'm Scott McLeod. I'm an anthropologist and I'm developing Wiki World University and School, which is like MIT open courseware in five languages with Wikipedia in 299 languages. There's a little bit of a social justice um, hint in it, in that we'd like to create uh, free universal education, major online high schools and universities in all 200 countries' official languages, so how to make highest quality education online available to um, all 200 countries' uh, students. I'm Chris Chitzy, I'm in the chemistry department, and I am the host of Chemex Squared, which is a related summer program. I'm Isabel Haithcox. Um, I've been teaching for 21 years, most of those years at Notre Dame Denver University, but for the last two years I've been full-time at Notre Dame High School in Belmont, so that's been an interesting shift. <laughs> it's, uh, both schools are founded by the same nuns, quite a, quite a big mission on social justice. 
and yet I've never really incorporated that into any of my chemistry classes. So this, I'm hoping, will be the inspiration I need because I'd love to do more. Uh, I'm Jennifer Thomas. I teach um, AP Chemistry and Chemistry, and I'm Science Department Chair down at St. Francis High School in Mountain View. And I'm very interested in, we're looking to rewrite our chemistry curriculum. Um, I'd really love like a green chemistry focus, but I think social justice dovetails really nicely with our um, school's theme and motto. Hi, I'm Jeff Baker. I am a former biology and English teacher. Um, and I currently work with the New Teacher Center and we support science teachers and those science teachers who would like to coach other science teachers. Um, I'm Chris Lipsky. I teach uh, high school chemistry, 10th grade at Hillsdale High School up in San Mateo. And I'm Suzanne Burroughs. I'm a former middle school science teacher and high school chemistry teacher. That's a common denominator. <laughs> um, I also do my credential work at Notre Dame. And I'm here at CSET as the Strategy Implementation Manager. I'm Tammy Moriarty. I'm on staff here at CSET. Uh, I work closely with Emily in uh, science programming in general for CSET as well as uh, teacher leadership. I'm Janet Carlson. I'm the director of CSET. Um, I try to support all of our programs across all content areas. As a science educator, I do have a soft spot for the work we do in science ed. <laughs> So welcome all. I'm very excited because this is the eclectic mix we strive for in the Pondering Excellence series. So um, we should be able to do quite a bit of pondering today. And so we wanted to start by kind of getting a sense of where you guys are coming from. And we're going to give you like a minute and a half to turn and talk to somebody near you and ask, what do you remember from your first high school class? So the first time you took like a chemistry focused class, What's something that sticks in your memory that you remember from that? If you have time, also think about like how often you consciously use chemistry in your everyday life. And if you're a teacher, that's probably like fairly often. So thinking outside, <laughs> outside of the time that you're teaching your people, where are some of the places where you like consciously think about chemistry? So take a minute and a half, two minutes, and find someone near you and chat. What I really remember most is my one of my friends burning off the for burning a bit of the first time, and she lit a Bunsen burger. So, um, that's true, but I remember my first time. It was a dramatic moment. I don't remember the very first day. Oh, yeah. An inspiration. Like, yeah. Yeah. I was really taken by uh, one of the. Uh, it was actually a middle school uh, physical science lab. We did many things. We made first lab. But the one I really liked was distilling wood chips, wood alcohol. Um, I think that may have been my little. You know, I think the common name is everyone remembers that kid that she could never do it in class, but she did in class. It's dangerous. I remember uh, the teacher. I, titration was an interesting process to observe, but. Um, Mr. Wilde was the teacher who went by the nickname Hud, and it was uh, a high achieving high school, and um, it was an interesting. Wrap up where you are, and then we're going to come back together in like 10 seconds. Uh, but that also said. Mine was a disaster. How did I? How did I get that? I went to an all girls school. They hired a chemistry and physics teacher who had retired from one of the. All right. So as you guys come back together. <laughs> um, maybe in the interest of time, we'll just take one or two. But like, what's something that you, that stood out that you remember from your first experience with chemistry class? Anyone want to share? Why don't you go ahead? Um, I think you were the chem teacher's first experience. Oh, yeah. was. Well, I, I said it was my aha once I got there because it was the science all of a sudden I loved. It like brought everything together. But what I really remember most, I, 
is my um, friend burning off part of her bangs the first time <laughs> she lit a Bunsen burner. I bet the teacher remembers that. <laughs> I would guess, just a hunch. Maybe one other person want to share something they remember? I mean, I just remember what a great teacher I had. I can remember snapshots of her having us like mark up our periodic tables with electron configuration patterns, and I can remember the acid-base titration, but I grew up in a very small town in Iowa of 180 people, so to have such a dynamic teacher, I was, we were talking, probably very lucky to have her for two years of chemistry. Yeah, so one of the things that, when I was teaching chemistry, and I would tell people I was a chemistry teacher, like, I got one of two reactions, either like, oh, I loved chemistry in high school, and then like a story about that, or like a, Oh, I hated chemistry in the high school. Let me tell you why I hated it. And I like very rarely got something in between. Um, as someone who really loves chemistry, I might say that that's because chemistry is inherently really fantastic. And like the only way that you don't love it is if you had a bad high school chemistry experience. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about like the theoretical framing of the ideas behind this crazy idea that we came up with last spring that we wanted to implement. So. One of these is starting with the idea of like, what are some of these traditional ways that chemistry is taught that end up being stumbling blocks, that keep people from having that aha moment, that excitement, that like wanting to take the class for two years and keep going. Um, and some of these are an inadequate emphasis on what's useful to students. So not actually seeing what's really helpful and useful. Information overload. Like there's a lot of chemistry because like everything is chemistry. So there's a lot you can do with chemistry, but it can be overwhelming very easily. Lack of relevance. So often kids say like this, I don't, why do I care? And then lack of transfer, where kids will really understand a concept really well, but they can't apply it. They can't show how it matters in another situation. Or you end up with kind of this like collection of isolated facts. They know a lot, like a little about a lot of things. And so one suggestion that's come up and has been tried several times is about, okay, so let's take this chemistry content, let's put it into a context. Let's teach chemistry through a context. And there are quite a few, there are quite a few different curricula that exist that have done this. So Living Back Chemistry and ChemCom, I know, are used in some different school districts in this area. And overall, there's a lot of positive research that has come out of these showing that as far as learning, you learn just as well and you show improved attitudes and motivation. So we started from this place of kind of thinking like, okay, so there's something really useful here about taking something, putting this content into this broader context, and maybe it has these positive effects on attitudes and motivations. Um, and because we are maybe a little crazy, we thought, okay, but what else can we do? Where can we push this further? Um, and we came across this, which I really like. Um, as a framing of thinking about chemistry education. So I'm going to break this tetrahedron down. At the base here, there's a triangle that this shows up in a lot of literature around chemistry education dating back to the early 1980s as far as like, why is chemistry so complicated? And the answer being that you have to understand it at all of these levels simultaneously. So you have to understand like what's going on in the atom in a redox reaction. There are electrons going back and forth. But you also have to understand what a redox reaction looks like at scale, that you see something maybe going between an elemental form and an ionic form, and you can actually see that. And symbolic, being able to write that out in a chemical reaction and interpret it when someone else does, and you have to know and use all of those. So that's like the content. And then, because researchers are always adding the stuff that other researchers have come up with, um, there's this idea to add, okay, but what about the human aspect? So let's take this triangle and let's make it a tetrahedron. So we're gonna add this extra point. And then this version of it actually kind of divides this tetrahedron into three levels. The base one is applied chemistry. So the thing I like about this model is that at the base of it is the content. Like you have to understand the content. You can't just try and jump with kids into like, let's talk about, like let's criticize chemistry, like let's critique science if you don't have a solid grounding in the science. So I feel like that's really important. Applied chemistry is like, okay, you know the science, you can write those redox reactions, 
let's do a lab and let's be able to use that content to explain the electroplating that we see happening in this lab and let's be able to use that and draw out the reactions. Sociochemistry is then like taking that a little further and saying, okay, what are the issues in the world that this chemistry helps explain? Um, so this might be something like issues of water contamination where you have heavy metals leaching into different groundwater sources and understanding the oxidation and reduction involved. And then the one that is most towards this human point is stepping back and saying, okay, and where is that happening? Where are the situations where that's most likely to happen? Um, like maybe they're in super fun sites, tend to release methane that creates a reducing environment, and you're more likely to have heavy metals leaching into groundwater. Where, who are the people who are living there? Why, are, why is that happening? And someone mentioned green chemistry earlier. Bringing in things like green chemistry principles of let's actually, instead of cleaning up waste, let's produce less waste to begin with, and what would it look like to redesign chemistry in that way? So it's the same idea, and the other thing I really like about this is that each builds on the other. So you can't just jump to here and have something that's a really meaningful learning experience if you don't have all of these as well. All right, so this was kind of part of our framing is that we wanted to design something this summer that would give teachers a chance to develop lessons that would work with all of these levels. So not just here, not just here, but working through all of these. So I wanted to give you guys a chance to see what this might look like and play with it a little yourselves. So the handout you just got is just this piece. Up here I put it in the context so you can see this is from the Living by Chemistry textbook. Um, it's the unit summary, so this is kind of the like end of unit suggested extra project after the like summary, review exercises, and then this is where that is. And what I want to give you guys like five minutes to turn with the neighbor and discuss is where do you think that this activity would be situated on that tetrahedron? So within these different levels, where would you put that activity? And, and this is why it's really great that we have so many chemistry educators in this room because that makes the second part of this discussion a little bit easier of what might you do to adapt this to bump it further up the period? To like add a level that builds in something further up. So we're gonna give you like five minutes Again, to turn and chat with somebody and dig into this a little bit and think about, okay, what does this actually look like? So before we start talking about what we did, we want you to get a sense of like, what is it that we're trying to get teachers to do? Where are we trying to go? Well, yeah, being a toxin gets into the fact that this is, this is a social issue, but not into the issue of, yeah, as I understood it, what she called the principal mechanics of the person, where there's some social aspect where yeah, we're out of society, so that there's a missing piece in the project itself, but that in and of itself, if you want to go to this level, it's like this level, it's like this level, it's like this you may think it's being there. It could be doing it. It could be doing it. It could be doing it. If it's something which is very something which is Play for uh, understanding and knowing the chemistry. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. If this is right, you might take the same project and yeah. push it into the top. Yeah. Oh, sure. So I'm saying, right. Exactly. 
you cannot like the socio level could be the environmental protection agency or the critical reflexive chemistry depending on how the teacher used in terms of critically thinking about its effects on the environment could come back to the EPA but where and who is what I said. Yeah. It's the, the where and who, it's not just the what. Yeah, but I mean, my question is how do you, how do you move it if we just accept that it is in the sociochemistry level, yes. um, or at least the intentionality level, um, what would you do to... I'm going to give you about one more minute. This is the kind of conversation that can go on for half an hour. Eventually, yeah. this became a concern. Right. I mean, why is it an issue for the environmental protection agency seems to bring it into for me the critical intensity. I was going to make the suggestion you might actually look at the history of your talk and congratulations. When and how we decided to do that, that's usually what we're going to Again, this is like you could probably spend at least a half an hour just digging into this and coming up with ideas. Uh, maybe just I actually am interested in this. Can I get like one or two suggestions that you guys threw out as far as what you could do that would move it up, that would bump it more towards that human tip of the pyramid. Does anyone want to share out a suggestion you had? We didn't quite get there, but I would say okay. we, we sort of located it at the sociochemistry level, mm -hmm. and so it didn't have this reflective, the who and the what, of mm -hmm. the who's affected and, mm -hmm. and where where is it affected. Yeah. And I think another question added to the project about where are the impacts of this toxin most felt mm -hmm. and who has been impacted by it historically mm -hmm. or in your community, where is it likely to be a problem, mm -hmm. locating it and thinking about who is impacted by it. Yeah. And that doesn't have to be a lot more to the project, but it does have to be another point. And I like that you said that because that's one of the places we started from is that this isn't like a throw away everything that you've ever done, like everything has to start from scratch. The idea of using this model is that it's building on a lot of the stuff that you're already doing and incorporating these additional human levels of like who and where and what's the history of this. Um, so just to be the devil's advocate, so mm -hmm. we felt this was a throwaway attempt at trying to be socio or higher. Mm -hmm. And what was your reasoning? If you look at the actual questions that are asked, the whole EPA thing becomes very token because in terms of the EPA, all you're doing is looking up a published number. Mm -hmm. And how is it reported, I assume, has to do with units, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. After that, you're back to very, what I would consider classic chem content. Mm -hmm. So we we started hoping it was in the middle level, and mm -hmm. it got moved down the more we looked at it. That was actually the reason I picked this specific example, is because when I looked at it, I thought you could make a very strong case either way. So I like purposely picked it because I thought it would be a more interesting <laughs> one to discuss. And also because to a certain extent it probably depends on how the teacher frames it in the classroom. Absolutely. That it, it's kind of on the thing. Oops. I might see it's <laughs> this thing is backwards of the way it should be. Um, it's kind of like here. And so how the teacher frames it might affect where it ends up. But um, so that is a great segue right? into what we think Teachers are so important in this process. So what we did is we pulled from a lot of ideas that are already out there about social justice teaching and social justice teaching in science. Um, big ones being this idea of it being active, where kids are actually the ones who are making meaning. Kids are the ones who are doing something with the content. They are finding a reason to use it. You're not telling them why they should use it. Um, critiquing the norms of science. So instead of just accepting that everything about science is the way it always has been, of uh, pushing back on that a little bit and introducing that idea to students. Um, and in chemistry in particular, a lot of this ends up around like toxicity, who's affected, um, why are those, why doesn't, why don't certain things get caught earlier? Like that, considering a community, so the effect, the effect that science doesn't happen in a vacuum, and that students are not entering into your classroom from a vacuum either. They come in with their own ways of understanding science, talking about science, talking about ideas, 
that are really important and valid, and as teachers, you can pull on those and capitalize on them. And so, from all of that, this is where we ended up. So these are these five key ideas that we pulled out that are things that teachers would be doing in the classroom if they are implementing this idea of chemistry for social justice. So they're incorporating those socio-scientific issues. Um, and then they're also connecting to local relevant phenomena. So this might be something like climate change. This is maybe like, what's the immediate impact on your local area? Um, providing activities for student action. Implementing equitable classroom practices. This is a really important one. We'll touch on it more later on. Um, but especially when you're bringing in all of these issues, making sure that all of your students feel valued and heard and like they are an important part of the classroom. And then this is just as critical as all those other pieces. Like, you want your kids to know chemistry. You want them to understand that deep and nuanced understanding of chemistry. And the whole goal, the outcome of this, is for the students to have this, which is for students to walk away from your chemistry class with a praxis where they are reflecting and acting upon the world in order to transform it. And in this theory here is our idea of like, that's the chemistry content that they have. So this is from Freire, this idea of you're acting, you're reflecting, you're using the knowledge that you have, and then there's this like constant arrows going back and forth, constantly cycle towards practice. So this was where we ended up as far as what we want our teachers to do, and Sarah's gonna talk a little bit about what we did with them this summer. All right, so I want to point out something that was important to us as we tried to come up with a name for this program, which is that we chose chemistry for social justice really specifically rather than chemistry and social justice because we have a fundamental belief based on one of the theoretical framework that Kevin just laid out for you, that these two things have to be deeply intertwined. It will not work in the classroom and it won't work for kids if the social justice is an add-on. It's kind of a throwaway thing as we were discussing. So I think we wanted to talk about chemistry and service of social justice and those two things sort of being really tightly inter intertwined or linked. Okay, can I do it? <laughs> okay. Um, so, we thought really hard about what makes good PD, both for us as former teachers, but also as PD providers and our experience in the literature around professional development. We thought, we don't have very much time. So what are the things that we really want to come out of this summer and a, sh a small amount of follow-up during the year? The most important thing we thought would that would sort of carry this forward beyond the two days is to start developing a community and a network of teachers who can rely on each other and talk to each other and who feel supported by one another as they kind of go through this really risky process of, I think it's a very risky process of change. So trying to set the, the, the just the ground level community during the summer was really important to us. We wanted also to start developing some ideas about the ways we can understand social justice. It is not something that has a really clear, simple, one-off definition that everyone agrees on. It's a complicated concept and there's lots of different ways to come at it. And so what we wanted to do was rather than tell them what social justice is, to sort of build a shared understanding of some of the ways we think about getting there. And then we also wanted to make sure that teachers felt like they were supported to go and apply these ideas back in the classroom in a really tightly <coughs> intertwined way with the chemistry they're already teaching. And we also wanted to focus on helping them think about praxis because we found it to be the most difficult part both as teachers and in creating this workshop is how do you get, how do you support kids in taking action and building a more equitable, um, more just world around them through the context of the science that they understand. So, those were our outcomes. Community, understanding social justice, and ready to apply it back in the classroom. And we totally succeeded, so it was great. <laughs> Here's our model. So this was, um, these are kind of like roughly like sort of chunks over the two days. We really started by trying to build that community. Um, and we did all of this work through the context of chemistry phenomena. It was not just like, and now we're gonna build a community, talk about like your favorite sport or whatever. It was all grounded in the science the whole way through. So we were building everyone's capacity to think about science during this work. So we spent a fair amount of time actually building community. Then we really dug into social justice and we had a lot of conversations and a lot of collaboration around what that could look like and what it means for the classroom. 
Then teachers in collaborative teams had time to, to sort of like modify some existing lessons and uh, develop some strategies that they could take back to the classroom and use with their students in their context in ways that would be meaningful and relevant to their practice to apply these ideas. And then finally, in February, we had a one-day follow-up where we brought teachers back together who talked about how fun it was and then some of the challenges. And we also looked at student work and started thinking about how students were engaging in these processes and the ways in which students were understanding chemistry through this lens of social justice. So this is like a big picture, and I'm just going to show you a few artifacts from, from the workshop that teachers made, and then Emily is going to talk in more detail about the meat and, and uh, the meat of the science. Okay. So who were these people and how did we get them? So our recruitment, I would say largely informal, um, but uh, we did reach out to a lot of contacts. We used social media, we used Twitter. I didn't put Twitter on there, but we used to be tweeted. We Instagram, we Facebook, we did all the things. Um, and we talked to the people we knew in the Bay Area, um, and also some people from further afield. Um, we used CSET as a resource, and it was incredibly helpful to have the support of, like, of not just the intellectual work that we did here, but also the support of the logistics team. I mean, talk about a fantastic place to do PD, I cannot even tell you. Um, it was amazing. So we used Chemex Squared, and we also sent out a blast through CSET, and from that, we ended up having in the room 16 chemistry teachers. Um, two of them were from private schools, uh, three were from charter schools, and 11 were from public schools. They had between one and 20 or more years, I didn't get that exact number, but of teaching chemistry. So there was a very diverse group of folks in the room in terms of their, their chemistry teaching experience. And the gender balance wasn't too far off, which is kind of amazing for an education group, but it is chemistry, so. Sarah, so in that one to 20 plus years, mm -hmm. Just ballpark. Kind of sprinkled, or did you have some bins? I feel like a lot of mid-career teachers. Yeah. Like okay. I was saying, like <laughs> that would make sense to me. Yeah, like yeah. I was gonna say. Yeah, I was gonna say like ten was about normal. So mostly folks with experience, but there was definitely a pretty wide range. Maybe normally distributed. Exhibition. I'm making that up. <laughs> so. As we started talking about social justice with teachers, we had them get together and start thinking about what that could mean in their classroom. And we had them sort of create these maps of what they thought it meant based on some resources that we gave them and some large group discussions. And folks came in with really different levels of understanding about what social justice is. And so this was one team, and we thought that they kept it very simple. They were mostly new to the idea of what social justice could be, and they really thought about where social justice could occur, and then sort of very um, very grounded in the individual, I would say, and very focused on just making sure that equity happening. Contrasted with another team who really thought about social justice in a quite a different way, which was thinking about power, agency, what students and teachers are doing in the classroom, and then this foundation of classroom norms and expectations. So you can kind of see that there were so many different perspectives in the room as we were going through this idea of social justice that it, um, I don't think we ever came to a consensus, and I think that that was okay. I think actually that was, made it richer and, and much more interesting. So this was sort of the culmination of our social justice grounding together. We also talked about what that looks like in the classroom in terms of equitable teaching practices. And after some conversation, this was sort of like the share out, we kind of did a more of less of model. So if you want to have equitable teaching practices, what do you want to do more? And then knowing if you're doing something more means you have to do something else less because time is a thing. And so one of the challenges is oftentimes with PD, teachers get more stuff pushed on them without any acknowledgement that something else is going to have to recede in, in order for the other to advance. So thinking about student-led discussions versus teacher-centered instruction, which is a pretty straightforward one. Um, but what I really I loved that this realistic portrayals of the science process, I thought that was such a great idea in terms of thinking about equity. Um, and there's a ton of great ideas, but in the interest of time, I'll move on and say that this was a really rich discussion, and I think one of the big surprises for me um, in, the, in the two days was that this, I think, was very generative in support of teachers. 
finally, we had them get together and work on lesson development, taking some of these ideas that we shared with them. And the way we did this is we asked them to set some goals. And instead of just setting an academic goal, or sort of like a learning goal, we had them set a justice goal as well. Furthermore, the learning goal was three-dimensional, aligned with the next generation science standard. So we asked them to think about what do you want students to walk away with in terms of social justice, or what do you want them to make progress toward? in terms of social justice. <clears throat> what science and engineering practice do you want them to focus on? <laughs> what disciplinary core idea is central to this chemistry that you're teaching? And what cross-cutting concept are you going to use as a lens to view all of these things together? And so this was a very, it was so, super simple, not complex at all. Worked really well. <laughs> it actually led to some fantastic conversations. I don't know that all of the goals were like the most brilliant goals I've ever seen in my life. However, the discussions that I heard when talking about lesson planning were so deep and so complex that I think um, all the folks really got a lot of it. We also asked them to come up with a phenomenon and a question about that phenomenon uh, so students would be really grounded in, in the science. And we also asked them to think about the assets that their students brought to the lesson. This kind of, not every group did this piece, but we wanted to make sure that they were coming from the perspective of their students bringing stuff into the classroom and what is it that they're building on rather than like what gap are you trying to close, right? So these are some examples. Um, the Justice School students of all um, abilities and backgrounds are empowered to collaborate and participate. And so this was a very equity-oriented student justice goal. And this one is critical mediators and the use and interpretation of data. So this is students really becoming like critical actors in the scientific process. And so we found that there was a lot of heterogeneity around uh, between the collaborative groups in the room. And we felt that that was one of the principles we wanted to um, honor in terms of professional development and that we wanted it to be where the teachers were in a way that it was useful for them rather than our superimposed idea of what they need to be putting as a goal. So I just wanted to talk for a minute about phenomenon-based teaching and, um, well, first of all, what are phenomena, right? There's like, there's some debate about this. This one, this quote is from the STEM teaching tools, like one page sheet thing. I like it, I think it's really simple. It's just observable events that occur in the universe and that we can use our science knowledge to explain or predict. It has to be a thing, not an idea, <laughs> right? And it's not like gravity is not a phenomenon, but dropping something on hitting it full, if, and it hitting the floor is a phenomenon. So why use phenomena? Because this was a big push for teachers, and it was actually really hard to think of phenomena um, in chemistry for this purpose. Um, the goal of building of science is really to explain phenomena. Designing solutions that arise from phenomena is the goal of engineering, or one of the goals of engineering. And so phenomena are central to both science and engineering, right, Grace? Can you say that again? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm like, I've got the engineer in the room, I'm like, oh. Uh, but, uh, in the problems that engineering seeks to solve are the results of phenomena, right? But if fair, would you agree? <laughs> um, the other reason to support teachers in thinking about phenomena is that they're central to the next generation science standards. They're emphasized in the science framework, California science framework, and they're emphasized in the you know big NRC framework. And so, what we wanted teachers to have the opportunity to do is to think about not just how to think about social justice, but how to shift their teaching in the ways that they're being asked to shift in their schools right now. So, with a neighbor, we would like for you to discuss this. What phenomena are useful for understanding chemistry? And can you understand them from a social justice perspective? So like, think of a phenomenon and try and think of a social justice application. And this is your shortcut to what phenomena are. Okay, so let's take maybe, uh, maybe two minutes, a minute and a half. Peanut, neither peanut or nut discuss. Um, so focus. Yeah, so focus. <laughs> Peanut, neither peanut or nut. Yeah. 
No, I I was looking at you when I said it. I was like, oh my god. Are you Climate change, then it would be helpful to understand the phenomena of the molecules of chlorine and fluoride, chlorine or fluoride. And there you have the phenomena of uh, chlorofluorocarbon and carbon, and you have a social justice issue in the loss of land and destabilization of weather patterns. because it is a challenge and also really fascinating actually to think about. So Emily is going to take over and tell you about how we felt discussing this very question. <laughs> productive struggle. <laughs> uh, we just wanted you to feel for just a minute how hard this can be because we sat together for three hours at Coho and I, I, I wasn't sure that we were going to ever make it out. So the goal was just to figure out we, we, we said, okay, we want to engage in the process that we're asking teachers to engage in. We want to engage in a really phenomenon-based approach. We want to ask ourselves those questions. Which, which phenomenon will really um, need the chemistry to understand? So chemistry for social justice. And chemistry defined narrowly, not broadly. So this was one of the struggles is that Catherine and I are just sitting here and we're like, we want it to be down to the atomic level. If you can explain it without thinking about the particle nature of matter, then it doesn't count. <laughs> so that pushed a lot of things out. And we didn't want to do water quality, because that's the one thing that there are a lot of models already out there. We wanted to do something really different. Um, we sat there for a long time. Uh, oh, oh, another thing, we, we, and so we find that most of the examples are, you know, they kind of flip to something very clearly biology or kind of very clearly environmental science. I'm very, I think interdisciplinary curricula is great, but I also think that our school structures don't support them very much. So we wanted to pick something very, very focused, and it was very, very uh, hard for us to find. Um, but we're, we're happy what we we'll, we'll get in the end. So. Um, uh, I'm going to show you a video of the phenomenon we picked as our central focus, just to warn you, um, it is a scene of a fire. So if you've had any, there were a lot of talk about fire. We found that fire was very uh, memorable <laughs> in your high school chemistry experiences. But if you've had any personally disturbing in incidences with fire, you might want to step off for a second because it's, it's a bit of a dramatic video. Some of you may have seen it already. Um, and we were just trying to get the sound going earlier. Right so. Fire is a phenomenon. How can we begin to understand the scale of the disaster that began in the early hours of this morning? What went wrong? And might it happen again? First, it's worth knowing that buildings like this are designed to contain fires. The idea is that if a fire breaks out, the fire brigade will have the time to combat it before it spreads. That's why the building had a so-called stay put policy. People were supposed to stay in their flats until the fire was dealt with. In this case, the, the tragic situation seems to be that the stable strategy that was in play. Disaster that began. Um, okay, I'm gonna just cut it off there, a little quick taster. Um, and we're gonna ask you guys to engage in a little element of um, a technique that we use with our teachers called the question formulation technique. It's a very structured protocol for helping students to develop uh, questions and refine their questions as well. 
Um, so uh, we really liked that process because we thought that this idea, it's, it's a very open brainstorm generation of questions, all questions are valued. We thought that had important implications for equity and it's also directly related to the NGSS um, SEP of asking questions. So we'll give you just a second to, and if you want to know about the full technique, there's a, a link there that you can check out. Um, just a few seconds to maybe chat with your partner. What are some questions that you have about this phenomenon that you just saw? It would appear that staying in place was bad. <laughs> And I don't understand how it's structured, a rough concrete building, put a fixing on his life from the engineers. I could understand that a structure is that cool. It's just a way of fire to maybe change the but you cannot the fire safety leave people in their place. Yeah, what's interesting about your question is that question sits up here. I mean, I couldn't do this. And so I think, now, well, they question is, is it now something about the building and then what floor by the fire is by the fire? Which question you might ask to get to. Well, and if they, we've seen the whole thing. Unless they are like, like, like the boots or like the yeah. things so the that they have the phenomenon that, 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 that they, they could get. Yeah. Yeah. And because I think that's correct. Be, yeah. 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 Wrap up the last question. I think you can imagine that you could easily spend 20 minutes generating really good questions about this phenomenon. I'm not sure if they have questions. They're generating explanations, not questions. And we wanted to point out that that's part of the technique, that we can take statements and turn them into questions that we can explore, either through research or experiment. Okay, so we, um, we thought that this phenomenon had a lot of affordances. Um, okay, I have to like, I can only have like 30 seconds to talk about the chemistry, which I think is just so interesting. The chemistry of the actual spread of the fire is fascinating. Um, it has to do with this, um, this system of the building construction. There was this aluminum coated polyethylene uh, outer cladding is what they call it. Um, the polyethylene that they used was not treated with flame retardants as it was meant to be treated with flame retardants. So there would have been a 10% difference in cost if this had been a flame retardant treated version of the cladding. Since it wasn't, the combination of this flammable um, internal part of the cladding with an air cavity that basically acted as a chimney to fuel your fire caused the whole front of the building to just for flames to rush rush up the the building. And it was um, a retrofit to put that on. It was a retrofit, right? And they subsequently went and did some tests and, and found that you know 100 out of 191 buildings tested in London, 190 had the non-flame retardant treated cladding. Was the policy based on the assumption that it was treated? The policy, yeah, was was based on the standards that were supposed to be in place for the flammability of this cladding. Um, that that then weren't met when it was actually tested. Then I read the subsequent thing today as I was thinking, in case Chris is in the room, I want to be sure I really know the chemistry. And I found something super interesting that someone has done some subsequent um, testing and found out that actually the insulation had moisture in it as well. So in the case of a fire, this moisture in the insulation would turn to steam. And steam reacts with aluminum uh, to produce hydrogen gas which is extremely flammable, um, which doesn't happen in everyday life because aluminum is reactive and forms an oxidized surface that then protects it. But if you, when you melt that off, it basically, like there's a chance that hydrogen was produced as well. And that can explain part of this like runaway fire that was caused. Um, this was a social housing complex, which means it was government subsidized housing. Um, there's some interesting data coming out about the building materials used in different, in, in different buildings of different categories in different parts of London. And then there's some really interesting, of course, talk around the, the state of policy. Okay, trying to get 
tried to keep that short. But maybe you should say about why we chose that particular fire and maybe not one that's more local. Uh, yeah, that was in oh, later was slides. Go. But um, go ahead. Go. <laughs> I mean, it's, so there are pros and cons to picking a phenomenon like this. Um, I think that the science is incredibly rich of this particular phenomenon, and it led into something we thought could really relate to students in their individual lives. We also thought um, it is a little bit distant, which is a constraint, but also an affordance in a certain case. Like maybe we wouldn't want to talk about the ghost ship fire in Oakland directly because it's like a little a little too close to home. So we do have a lot of fires here that would be it would be good for the students to know more about them, but to keep it a little bit distant might might be a benefit as well. Is that what you're thinking? Okay. <laughs> Um, so here was our unit outline. Um, it's a bit complex, but we wanted to draw from skills that we thought that the teachers would probably, some teachers would be coming in with, like understanding by design framework, the concept of an anchoring phenomenon um, through the NGSS. So we developed this entire unit plan around the anchoring phenomenon of the, of the Grenfell fire. Um, we wanted to show that, the, that these um, state and national standards are really useful in helping us to figure out the science of what's going on, that this is a context for which we can use particular practices, look at core ideas, and look at cross-cutting concepts. Um, and we also wanted to show how some things that you're already doing in chemistry can build towards this phenomenon. So the chemistry of combustion, calorimetry, are some really you know, classic chemistry things that we do, but they're put in service of something different in, the, in this case. And then we move into something like maybe a little bit more, <laughs> a little newer and exciting, flammability. And then moving on to this topic of flame retardants, which were really central to the phenomenon itself, and also are really important um, in our daily lives, even though we, we might not think about it very much. So here are some samples of like what our lessons would look like. For the chemistry of combustion, we focused on modeling different combustion reactions. So this is some kind of standard standard fare, although like this type of modeling I think is a little bit new to teachers. Um, a classic calorimetry experiment would be very relevant to understanding this phenomenon. Uh, and so each of these would be a lesson sequence. And then the third lesson sequence um, describing flammability, so looking at some different flammability measures of compounds based on their structures, which is uh, very much a higher level chemistry idea, um, and we thought that was really important. We wanted to show that you can take the, the thing that you're really focusing on, which is pushing you towards the social justice goals that you want to see, um, can be really advanced chemistry, unlike the example of like, I don't know, Google this one measure from the EPA, is kind of like the lowest level thing you can do. So what we were showing is getting closer to this, you can build in more and more advanced concepts instead of the contrary. Um, and then pushing a little bit towards what we thought were some of the social justice implications, looking at some of the fibers that we use in our everyday life. So an acrylic shirt that's low cost, that's highly flammable, versus um, like something made of wool is naturally flame resistant. Um, and talking a little bit about like flame retardant treated clothes or something that was big news in California in the last couple of years as well, some laws around flame retardants on, on, on clothing. And then we developed this fourth lesson sequence, which was about flame retardants in particular, that we thought we could link back to this, to this pyramid. So thinking about flame retardants, we developed this lesson sequence in which students would model the, the ways that flame retardants can work in general. Um, there are kind of three basic ways that they, they function chemically. Um, to look at the burning behavior of some natural fibers, so that's linking more to where does this affect me in my, in my everyday life. And then to push up to the critical level, um, you know, when I just Googled flame retardants, the first hit that came up is this American Chemistry Council. Do you all know this organization? They look, it looks very professional, and in fact, in my mind, that, that looked a little bit like the ACS logo, but I think I was maybe mistaken. It's just an industry group. It's an industry advocacy group, um, but if you Google flame retardants, you know, for 20 hits, all you're going to get are very biased industry sources. And we were, I was really fascinated by that and wanted to pick up on that. Uh, okay, so that can, was... Can I interrupt you before yeah, you go on and absolutely. ask? So flame retardants are controversial in the sense that there are both benefits of them and real hazards of them, which you didn't say, but I think you were, it was implicit in what you're saying. Is right. that right? Absolutely. And that's a, a, both a good thing from a social justice point of view, in other words, the subtlety and the, you know, the trade-offs. On one side. But it also makes it harder 
to keep the focus, or could could make it harder to keep the focus because you can kind of go down the the rabbit hole of arguments that for which there are millions of things online that you know, like you say, chemistry council will push flame retardants in situations where maybe really they're worse than. I don't yeah, no, absolutely. So, like, an activity would have to have a really specific focus. So, you'll see in our case study some of the like how the teacher specified the focus in particular ways. So, I think that it's it's important to pick something that has complexity, and then it's equally important for the teacher to make sure that any learning activities have a have a clear focus. Yeah. And I was curious about um, in your unit design uh, framework, uh, what were some of the catalysts? I shouldn't use catalysts. Uh, or maybe so, you should. <laughs> well, what were some of the prompts that you thought were particularly social justice focusing? Yeah, so we're going to kind of okay. get there with the teacher implementation. Awesome. So this was only the theory of it. And the reason why I didn't talk about that specificity is because it doesn't feel like it. This is, this is what we did over in Coho. Um, and it came to life when a teacher did it in the classroom. So I think some of these things are addressed by the way, by the, way the teacher implemented. Um, am I going the right way? <laughs> you know, it's really confusing. Okay, so um, one of our teachers came back and said, I implemented that fire unit with great success. And <laughs> we thought, oh my gosh, I didn't really expect anyone to do it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> uh, so it was a multi-grade honors chemistry class at a private school in San Francisco. Uh, we've talked a lot about how context is really important. This teacher felt like they had a lot of flexibility to try something different with students. So students already had a grasp of some of the fundamental chemistry in the sequence. We had intended that a student could come in not knowing about the concepts and could learn them through the frame of this phenomenon, calorimetry and models of combustion. This teacher didn't do it that way, and, and it worked for her. Um, so she did aspects of lesson sequences three and four, so the, you know, the more non-traditional ones about flammability and flame retardants. She added some really cool things to the um, frame that we had given. She brought in the example of a textile seller in Mexico. So she showed the students how textile sellers will hold up the rugs and hold um, fires to them to show that they are not flammable. So she was drawing in real life links, um, broadening the idea of who uh, owns this knowledge. Um, she did a lab on the flammability of uh, fibers, including flame retardant treated children's pajamas, which are very common. Um, I, was, I was scared. I knew that that was a good idea. I was scared to write in the lesson plan because I thought teachers would be like, we're not going to just go around burning things in our classroom. Um, but she thought it was a great idea and she did it. A couple of the specific things that she did that maybe speak to some of the questions. Um, she gave the students an assignment to go out and take a photo of a fire hazard. Um, and analyze it and explain it in terms of what they used, learned about flammability and the spread of fires. And then in terms of flame retardants, there was a specific application question um, on flame retardant and treated dorm sheets, so a personal decision. So when you go off to college next year, um, are you going to choose, your university may very well recommend that you get flame retardant um, treated dorm sheets. Would you, what would your decision be and why? Um, let's see, what was another? And I guess another example that will come up next, we did write some, oh, went the wrong way, spoiler. Um, we did write some activities analyzing the credibility of these websites. So it was less flame retardants, good or bad, but what claims are being made about flame retardants and how can we evaluate those claims? That was where this got really exciting is because the teacher came back and she said the students were outraged, that was her word, the students were outraged at these websites and they asked if they could write letters um, challenging the credibility of these websites. And so here's an excerpt from one of her students who you know, made several very strong arguments about why the website was biased. You can read the quote there. which is pretty, pretty powerful. There are a lot of really powerful statements. Um, and here are some of the teacher's reflections on the implementation of the unit. I'll just let you read through them.
So in terms of what went well, for her, the idea that the chemistry was very advanced was an affordance. That's what she wanted, and that the chemistry was integral to the things that they were talking about. She liked the lively discussion and the spectrum of opinions. Um, and if, as far as your question about flame retardants, good or bad, like in what case, we can also, if when we draw back to the phenomenon of the Grenfell fire, um, then it would, it would be a different answer for a different reason. Um, students were really offended at the chemical industry, uh, which I thought was great. Um, and as far as what was challenging, and these give us guidance as to where we want to go next, um, especially when she, so she made the um, right to a website assignment required. It was, it was, a student said, hey, we want to write letters to a website, and she said, great, well, why don't we let that be the culminating assignment? <laughs> so then she got all of these letters that students wrote to these <laughs> websites and thought, well, what do I do with that? <laughs> so um, she found it challenging to grade the work when there isn't a right or wrong answer, or another way to say that, there's, it's a, just a very different genre of writing. Um, the assignment about asking students to go out and look for fire hazards, they like they just played with it and kind of like created ridiculous situations and took a picture. <laughs> um, so she said that that lacked authenticity, but it did demonstrate understanding, and I mean, they were having fun, just kidding. Uh, and she, she found the models for flame retardants difficult, and um, you know, this is a context that she hadn't used her knowledge to explain before. Like, of course, she has all of the chemistry knowledge, but figuring out how to apply it to a certain context is a different, different situation. Well, can um, I make a quick, just yeah. technical point? Because I think it often comes up in a broader sense. Part of the problem with that last bullet item is that it is really complicated. It's one of the most treacherous chemical reactions because what you're trying to do is inhibit a branching chain reaction. And it's just incredibly hard to know, even if for people who study this, whether the models that they bring to it are going to apply to Granville or to a pair of pajamas or to the Mexican uh, rug seller. And so I would, I worry in a case like this that it defeats your ground level thing if you get tied up with this application it's sort of like asking, well, what's the chemical composition of this stuff right here? And that's a really complicated question, and maybe not a helpful level of question. And it's, just a, it's a point I just want to know if you had any thoughts about how to sort of juggle those. That one of the things that during our very long conversation um, was the, the issue that to like really explain this well, you need to have an understanding of radical chemistry, which is not something that's standard for high school. So that was something that we talked about. We talked a lot about figuring out the correct level and also tying it into this understanding that to a certain level you can always get infinitely more complex and explicitly positioning students like in terms of the complexity of your explanation where they are, and if there's more, like giving them a heads up that that exists, and that ties into, I forget, one of the sites talked about this idea of like, oh, it was on the more of, like mm -hmm. understanding the nuance and the complexity of science practices, incorporating it in that way. And also, there's like a little bit of an equity idea of like, maybe that'll spark them to think, okay, like I wanna know enough chemistry to really deeply understand yeah. this. But it is definitely something that is, that came up a lot during that, very long discussion where we tried to find a phenomenon of finding one that you can, yeah. that you absolutely need chemistry to explain, but you can explain with high school level chemistry. And it's it's a balance. I mean, that Venn diagram is <laughs> a very, very, very <laughs> narrow slice and of that is, that is in fact the biggest struggle of doing phenomenon phenomenon said to teaching. That mm -hmm. finding the phenomenon that's it's just right, the yeah. Goldilocks but but the the It has enough to, complexity, to but not so it. much that you can't really address it in and high school chemistry. I think that we, I, like, I didn't review this because the teacher didn't use it. I didn't make as much reference to it, but I think I worked really hard at developing um, a way of explaining three different basic phenomena that tried to like avoid the detail of the radical reaction. And I feel like I related it to other fire extinguishing methods, which were like a little bit more tangible. So I had done this 
three basic ways to extinguish fires, and then that was a parallel for the three basic mechanisms by which flame retardants can work. But I'm really fuzzy on those details of what I did now, but I can share them with you. Emily wrote a beautiful unit. Everybody yeah. should read it. I learned, I learned so much science. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> I think that uh, it was really fun, and I liked that process of learning, and I think that that would be another message about this is that, and, and this is actually how we want our classrooms to be constructed, is that we're all learners. Like, I, I have a lot of science knowledge. I didn't have all of this science knowledge, but I was able to draw on it in order to apply it in this context in a meaningful way. And that was, like, hugely satisfying to me. Um, it is a shift from thinking that the teacher needs to have a full understanding of everything that's there. And a shift that I really appreciate. What else did I have here? Oh, okay, um, and then just moving forward, uh, we are going to continue working with this teacher. Um, she's a great partner, and um, we want to help her develop the unit um, more for implementation in her context. So we are thinking about developing a tool for establishing the credibility of websites that was, that was important to the students, and that's something that's like a bit more tangible, um, doesn't get us too much in the muck of, of the details of the flame retardants. Um, and has like, that's so important. I mean, that's what our kids today have to do is go out there on the internet and try to figure out what information to pay attention to. Uh, that was a little bit outside of her comfort zone. Um, and so that's something we're going to work on together. And also maybe um, developing some kind of a rubric for this type of argument writing. And one of the things that we've also talked about doing is figuring out how we can link to what the students are already learning in English and social sciences. So this started from a really practical point of how can I develop a rubric for this? And we thought, we need to go talk to the English teachers. Catherine's husband is an English teacher. He gave us lots of ideas. Um, and that's helpful to the students, too, to see these interconnections um, between the disciplines. Uh, we want to... Um, we did, I didn't write as much about linking back to the Grenfell fire, and that's also because it's, it was like a little bit unfolding. There's more known about the actual materials that were used and the outcomes that happened. But, um, and so I looked back at it today, preparing for this talk, and realized that there is a lot of piecemeal information that's out there, and it's explained really badly on Wikipedia. So I'm imagining, like, why don't we have your students go in and take this information um, and see if they can make the Wikipedia site more, uh, understandable and coherent and generate an explanation for what happened in the Grenfell fire, which seemed really cool. Or maybe um, explanatory videos of, of what happened where they have a chance to pull together all the things that they learn to um, give an explanation of this phenomenon that would be on varying levels of, of depth depending on how they want to approach it or what the, who they chose as an audience for some kind of an explanatory video. Um, some questions that we have are well, and so that was the question, was, was this anchor phenomenon the most relevant one, given that it was somewhere else? We talked about kind of the pros and cons of that choice of a phenomenon. How would this have gotten in the classroom where students were encountering the core chemical concepts for the first time? Um, so this teacher took the approach of, we already know some basics of energy and modeling, and now we're going to add on these other layers. We designed a unit such that a teacher could, you know, in the, 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 like add those pieces inside. Um, those would be different implementations, clearly. Um, and we're really curious what caused the students to feel so empowered that they and are outraged <laughs> that they wanted to write to chemical companies, and how can we um, support that type of empowerment happening in other contexts as well? How can we figure out what happened there um, and, and, and support it in other places? So that's the end of the talk about our particular unit. Are there any more questions about that? Yeah. So how do you negotiate the um, you know, chemistry for social justice where you really want to build kids' conceptual understanding and that passion as potential future chemists with understanding that you know those websites aren't are, those are written by communications people, right? You know, they they probably have very little professional chemist influence. Um, so you don't wanna, you know, create some sort of negative construct um, for chemistry while they're looking at these things. God, these things are incredibly um, still there. So how do you how do you navigate that space of, of inquiry and their kind of rush to judgment because they want to find some agency, but also recognizing that you know, the, the problems don't probably lie in, they may lie in the science and how science is is part of the industry. 
Um, but you know, those are bigger questions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. And I think that I would argue that part of the goal is that students leave the course asking those questions. Yeah. That rather than like, because they're not questions, they're not going to have an answer of like, even if is chemistry good or bad for society like that's not a that's not a yes or no question but part of this social justice is that like action and empowerment that students leave feeling ready to go out and ask those questions when they come across it instead of feeling like ah this is chemistry and i don't understand it and it must be bad or oh this is chemistry and i don't understand it but it must be something good and, and I would just chime in that another really cool thing that this um, teacher did was had the students do chemist interviews. So they would go out and talk to chemists who were doing, you know, other kinds of work. Like, so we're definitely not trying to portray science as bad. We're trying to portray science as complex and used for lots of different purposes. So, I mean, really, it's a good point. It's really important to see the other sides, too, and how, how chemistry can be used towards these ends. And that's something that we want to be building and talking about green chemistry or talking about important uh, work with real life applications that, that other chemists are doing. I am going to have to run to my step supervisory, <laughs> but my fine colleagues here can, can take over this conversation. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. I'm wondering if in any of this fun conversation and generative process, uh, whether you've uh, explored the idea of a realistic virtual Earth at, at some five or ten years in the future. So I think Google Street View with Time Slider mm -hmm. at the atomic and cellular levels too. And one where you might even, um, this is sort of conceptually planning, um, engage, uh, there's a recent MIT um, Media Lab PhD, Scott Greenwald's electrostatic playgrounds. So you're moving molecules around with all augmented reality, still in its very early phase. Uh, you could see the fire emerge, um, you might be able to interact with it. Is that at all on the horizon think, you're thinking? Um, realistically, that's something I'm personally going to develop in the next five to ten years? Probably not. Um, I think if things like that are developing, it's really exciting. And ultimately, what it comes down to, and I think part of why we are so focused on working with teachers, is that how that is used and implemented in the classroom is really where the like whether it's an affordance or whether it's a negative thing so i think what we would really look towards is how are we preparing teachers that when those sort of things develop they're able to use them in a way that gets at all of these different levels of science and i think that's the power of you designing your work so it plays off frameworks yes. yeah because every example Dated, gets more complex, it gets something. Right. But if you start with a framework, mm -hmm. then as you new tools emerge, new knowledge right. emerges, whatever, new phenomenon are in the news. Yeah, you, the you, idea you that it's situated. Like, it's not so we like we designed a unit partly because there's just like not much out there. But a big part of it is really just about this way of teaching that can then, you know, and also like science is gonna keep changing. Like that's what's fun about it. The chemistry we teach now is different than what I learned when I was in high school. And rather than like having to redo a static curriculum every five years, like getting teachers with these frameworks able to like take that and incorporate it. So we've done a lot of reflecting. We are, I think all people, all three of us are very much like, okay, what's everything that we did that we want to do better next year? So this is, this is our version of that. But we'll start with a positive one as we kind of wrap up our reflections here. Um, this is from a teacher who went through our program. This is afterwards. This is a pseudonym. Um, but this is one of those really fantastic moments where someone who went through your workshop comes out articulating better than you ever have what it is that you're trying to do. So I'm going to read this. The SJ, social justice approach, has a much more critical eye. So what are the injustices and why are they happening? And you know, I think the Flint, Michigan water unit that we do is just like a prime example. So it's not just saying that this community has water that's undrinkable, but who made those decisions? Why were they made? And how can a student participate actively to bring about change using technical knowledge from whatever their 10th grade vantage point is, and sort of an activism approach around what can you do? Can you write letters? How do you become more informed? And so to me, the major <coughs> distinction is really about being pointed at those injustices. I think STS, and he's referring to science, technology, and society, this kind of in-context approach, offered a safety net for people to not push beyond the dominant paradigm. And I see social justice really as a requirement. 
that you have to look beyond the dominant paradigm and get multiple perspectives because we have a very a culture that's set up very systematically to marginalize the minority voice. So this was a really fantastic reflection of like just what that nuance is about what we're trying to do that's a little bit different, that's pushing a little bit further than some of this work that's been done before. Um, one of the things that I'm working on right now for my qualifying paper is learning a little bit more about how these teachers are thinking, especially since this is something that's a little newer. Um, I've been doing follow-up interviews with several of our participants, trying to get into, okay, after going through this, and Sarah talked at the beginning about this heterogeneity, that there's so many different ways to conceptualize this and so many different ways to conceptualize this in your classroom. Um, so I've been doing some work getting out there and talking to these teachers and finding out what it is that they're, how they're making sense of this, and then also if they've made changes in their classroom. At this point, I'm most interested in what's their reasoning. Um, kind of right in my head, I'm already planning my next step is now to get out into classrooms and see what these changes look like, but right now I'm interested in their reasoning. What is it that is driving those changes? Um, so I just wanted to talk just quickly about some of the big picture challenges we had around the professional development itself. So um, there were sort of three big categories that we thought were big issues we wanted to try and focus on as we go into the next year. Uh, the first thing is just around the curriculum. Just some of the challenges around phenomenon-based teaching, whether teachers are familiar with the NGSS, and what some phenomena that can be used with the social justice perspective are. These are This is a big area that teachers need a lot of support in, and like frankly, we need a lot of support in also. So um, that is a big focus, I think, going forward for us. Um, the next thing is thinking about our community and the community that we're trying to build to think about recruiting more broadly and more um, thoughtfully to get a, just a really nice group of folks in the room who have bring different perspectives. Um, thinking about the smaller networks within that larger community and how teachers are able to rely on each other and follow up throughout the year. And then finally, thinking about the kind of school environments that were represented in the room. Um, and so sort of like that leads into the social justice stumbling blocks, which we thought a long time about what to call them. But um, we found that a lot of the teachers who implemented were it was honors classes, it was charter schools, it was private schools, and so the context in which these things were being implemented were like sort of like higher SES, um, a lot more white kids, um, and so we thought that that was a really important thing to consider is when you're having these difficult conversations with affluent kids in the room, how do you keep this from turning into like some kind of like white savior, like I'm gonna go and solve all the problems of the world because I've got all this, all the answers, right? Um, and think about like how to develop their understanding of the agency of others um, and thinking about uh, how to deal with the issue of them making comparisons between contexts. So teachers set up, okay, well look at where we live and look at where they live. Now let's examine that. And when you're coming from an affluent perspective and these are the comparisons you're making, that can be a really, really um, tricky conversation to navigate. And so trying to think about how to support teachers in framing things um, from a less deficit-oriented perspective and from a more, how do we acknowledge the agency of all folks and like build up the agency of everyone. So, as we go forward. Yes, so we, thanks to CSET, had the opportunity to go and share some of what we've done at SEEDS, which is Science Educators for Equity, Diversity, and Social Justice, which is also a fantastic group that you should check out. Um, and we presented, talked a little bit about this workshop during a wondering, and got some feedback on it. Um, I real, we realized that we put up all the like things we can do to get it better. We did also get positive feedback, but again, we're always like, all right, what do we do? How do we make this better? Um, so thinking about more expansively what these inequities look like and making sure that we're aware of and considering all of those. Um, this piece of that value of facilitating difficult conversations and emotional reactions, I know like for me especially as a science teacher, like I didn't talk about like, I maybe talked about emotions one on one, but the idea of like having a class discussion where there's feelings involved is like slightly terrifying and I think that's the case for a lot of science teachers, but we need to do it if we're talking about something like social justice. And then also feedback, one of the things is that we ask teachers to implement, like to design and potentially implement several lessons and zooming back, coming up with a slightly simpler thing to ask to them to do so they're more likely to implement it and have time to implement it, reflect on it, and then go forward instead of kind of getting bogged. Yeah. All right, and then another thing we took away was this idea of a student empowerment framework. A lot of this is really important about 
like empowering students. So thinking about it academically, again, like it's important that they walk out knowing chemistry really well. Politically, so like do they feel that they have a voice and are they willing to share that voice? And socially, so this is that classroom dynamics, like does every student feel valued in your classroom? And so looking forward, um, some of the things that we are thinking about are ways of targeting, like Sarah said, building this professional community. So consciously thinking about who we're recruiting, where are we recruiting, how are we recruiting to make sure we get a diversity of voices, encouraging school-based teams, because one of the things we've seen, obviously, is that people who came with other people from their school are the ones who are primarily implementing it. It makes it a lot easier. Um, sustaining collaboration and continuing with alumni as well. And then also like identifying these people who have really been, we saw an example teachers who are really implementing and running with this and like bringing them on as partners. So recognizing that we can talk about this, the teachers we have who are actually teaching this in the classroom are a really important source of expertise and drawing on them as a source of expertise and as partners. Um, is something that we think is really important. So this is our final, going back to this idea of these five pieces that we had, um, some of the things that we're looking forward to 2018 to support each of these pieces. Um, so giving teachers space to consider their own understanding of what chemistry is, where can we maybe let teachers wrestle a little bit with that, is chemistry good or bad? When, where, what does that even mean? Give teachers space to wrestle with that because again, during the school year, teachers don't really have time to do that. So giving them the time and space to do that. We really want to focus on this and giving teachers kind of like those back pocket strategies to support some of the more emotional aspects and some of these more like equity focused ideas. Um, and then over here, these are sort of more the curriculum and community side developing networks and thinking about what will be sustainable and helping teachers connect in sustainable networks. Um, the resources, a big thing of this, like you guys saw, is just like having resources, having examples of phenomena, so kind of continuing to build that out and sharing on that, um, and then, again, narrowing down a little bit. So that's where we're thinking about moving forward. Um, and uh, we didn't put this on the slides, but also adding an extra day. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It turns out there's a lot to do in two days. It was, it was two two very very two 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 days. <laughs> and like trying to think about how to use the first day as um, sort of a, a repeat of some of the stuff that we did last year and the second two days as like collaborative time. Yeah. yeah. Like bringing so, in people who participated last year. So we could, we could set the ground with new folks and then invite the repeaters to come back and do some of that deep intellectual work with uh, the cohorts together. Mm -hmm. So, thanks so much to CZ yes. for all of the support and sending us to Seeds. We learned so much and yeah. I think we're developing a community now, like, our, like, it's a, like yeah. all these reciprocal <laughs> communities, like the, our community, like a teacher community, student community, and so that was really powerful mm -hmm. to get to connect with those folks and we'll get to connect with them again. Um, at NARST, so we have plans to like continue, continue that. talking about this with other people who are interested in this. So. Well, first, I want to congratulate you on a great piece of work. I think this is work that's really necessary, and and you've done something that's not only interesting but takes the takes the model of NGSS seriously and takes it a step further. So thank you. And I wanted to ask, do you think you could design an entire high school chemistry sequence that was all oriented around problems that are related to social justice? Or are they just perhaps that you couldn't do that I with? think I think you could. And I think, like when I said that, that developing the models isn't my five to 10 year plan, I think, let's call it 10 to 15 year plan. <laughs> For me, I think I would love, I think you can do it. I think it will take a lot of work and a lot of trial and error. A lot, yes. of, creativity. A lot much, of creativity. How much of the phenomena are already there in the standard curricula of chemistry <laughs> in the community, et cetera? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. I think they've been not highlighted, but it, right. A big part of it is, like we said, it's not starting from scratch. It's really a lot of it is about the framing and the focus and building on to stuff that already exists. I'm, I'm curious where, it, it's such a creative and um, sort of unfolding, uh, opening project 
to explore chemistry for social justice. I'm curious where the conversation might occur. Uh, Quaker high schools, Quaker colleges have had a long focus on social chemistry, long taught chemistry. How about other countries, other languages, that uh, South Africa that might have, after um, apartheid ended, um, developed a whole different approach to chemistry for social justice in one way or another? And um, if, if labs aren't available, so to see I'll call it phenomenological principles um, in the in the physical. Um, are are there other are labs out of this? I mean, um, no way. Okay. No, no, no absolutely other. not. Yeah, they're and super could they emerge different. differently online. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean they emerge they can look different, but yeah, no, they're definitely. They're not traditional labs, but they're doing lab work. Well, some are even really traditional. Yeah. We're doing like calorimetry, yeah. like you yeah. know, you're very it's in context. Yeah, but it's just in the service yeah. of a different purpose. Yeah. 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 Calorimetry yeah. not as an end in itself. You might right. do the same like actual like activity, but the questions that you are asking and the questions that the students are asking and responding to might look different. Cool. I would pause us to formally thank Emily and Abstentia. Sarah and um, Catherine, and then I encourage you to continue the conversation informally and take advantage of the snacks that we've provided outside. Thanks for giving us your Wednesday afternoon and yes. evening. We really appreciate yeah. your thoughts and, um, and I'd love to hear more from you yeah. if you have questions.